This is a dramatic reading of Why Quantum Mechanics is Weird, a blog by the stand-up physicist available at science2.0.com. The video Why Quantum Mechanics is Weird won the 2005 Berkeley Video and Film Festival Best of Festival Award in Education. That's actually second place behind the Grand Festival Award, which went to a film on polar bears, because polar bears are much cuter than just me talking for 27 minutes. In this blog, I will go through the math behind the video, which provides a novel entirely mathematical explanation of why causality is different between classical and quantum mechanics. Calculus done correctly in space-time turns out to provide the correct answer, completely philosophy-free as it must be. The riddle of why quantum mechanics is different from classical physics has been around since the birth of quantum mechanics in 1901. That's when Planck had an inspired leap to use only integers in order to resolve the black body radiation problem. Einstein applied that very idea to the photoelectric effect in 1905. Bohr got on the bandwagon by quantizing angular momentum as part of a model of the hydrogen atom. The math of all three is simple and consistent with experiments. And that's all physics really needs, equations that are consistent with, uh, with experiments. Well, uh, not exactly. I, we also demand a backstory, like why it all works. And that is an open issue with quantum mechanics, its interpretation. Uh, and so here are two less often used quotes on the subject. Interesting theory. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> Groucho Marx. And we have always had a great deal of difficulty understanding the worldview quantum mechanics represents. At least I do, because I'm old enough, man, that I haven't gotten to the point where this stuff is obvious to me. Okay, I still get nervous with it. You know? How it always is. Every new idea, it takes a generation or two until it becomes obvious that there's no real problem. I, I, I can't define the real problem, therefore I suspect there's no real problem, but I'm not sure that there's no real problem. And that was Richard Feynman. Now, the issue remains open today. I went to a talk titled The Cosmological Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics given by Max Tegmark at Harvard University in September 2010. And there, it's, uh, a variation on that is available on the web. The small room was just packed with grad students. And he started off with a survey. Which interpretation of quantum mechanics do you prefer? Now, no one voted for good old Copenhagen. It's like too old school. Hugh Everett's Many Worlds got about as the name, same number of votes as David Bohm's Pilot Wave Theory. Now, the fact that we voted on this issue, to me, was actually data that we needed new specific mathematical proposals. So I voted for D, <laughs> none of the above. Uh, you see, we never get to vote on physics, we understand. No, no. Instead, physicists fail people who get the accepted answer wrong. It's a harsh <laughs> subject. I mean, really. When we really get quantum mechanics, it'll be that harsh. Okay? People actually enjoy pointing out how Einstein didn't get quantum mechanics. 
Well, he most certainly understood the details of the photoelectric effect since it garnered him a Nobel Prize. And he most certainly understood Planck's uh, work since uh, he so admired the man. And he most certainly understood the math behind Bohr's atom, which can actually be taught to a sufficiently motivated high school student. What did he never understand? Causality. Classically, some event A leads to another event B leads to a third event C. That is what happens like in a Buster Keaton film, even if each event looks completely improbable. But special relativity is a, is a study of the subtleties of causality. And of course, Einstein was a grand master, and in fact originator, of the subject. Now, in quantum mechanics, all possible histories must be added up and averaged. If a certain, less, uh, a certain class of really unlikely events is omitted, then the calculated answer is a little bit wrong. That is one of the things that eats up supercomputer time chewing through the data of the LHC. There are so many things that could happen in a high energy collision that all must be accounted for before looking for something new. The math of quantum mechanics is flawless. One cannot set a bank of supercomputers to work on inverse fento barns of data unless the math is the best that we have constructed to date. And the math works fine without understanding causality in quantum mechanics. Here are the two largest ideas generated over the entire history of physics. Calculus and space-time. We most strongly associate these two developments with the two biggest names in the history of physics, Sir Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. Now, Gottfried Leibniz got the calculus on his own, uh, and he had the same kind of big bad uh, hair wig, but uh, and Einstein's uh, math teacher, Hermann Minkowski, really had to point out that the Lorentz transformation really represented a rotation in a space-time um, kind of geometry. Now, big ideas need big help. So, what are these two big ideas? Well, calculus is a precise mathematical study of change. Space-time is a formal link between the scalar time on my watch and a three vector um, for space. And my thesis is that if the calculus of space-time is done correctly, then we will understand the difference between causality in classical versus quantum mechanics. Calculus, when the scalar here goes to zero, is not the same as calculus when the three vector goes to zero. So a quaternion has a slot for the scalar time and the three uh, and three more for the three vector. Quaternions are a division algebra, meaning that addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are well defined. Now take out um, uh, an MIT calculus book, which uh, I bought for my first year, mm, Thomas and Finney. And um, if you go to, what page is this? Oh, page 31. Uh, this is a second edition? Fifth. Fifth edition. All right. Page 31. You'll, you'll see the limit definition. And you'll say, great, I'll apply that to quaternions. Oops. No. No, no. Um, this expression is meaningless for quaternions. The reason is that quaternions are not a mathematical field. The key difference between a mathematical field and a division algebra is that a mathematical field must commute, while division algebras may or may not. Quaternions do not commute. 
should that you know delta element be written on the right or the left? Well, it makes a difference for quaternions, but not for real and complex numbers. So this definition works for reals and complex, but not for quaternions. One of the guiding principles of my unfunded basement research project is that real and complex numbers are subgroups of quaternions. One must be able to pick out the real and complex numbers inside of the quaternion house with all their properties and functions because they live under the same roof. The problem with the limit definition of a derivative is the cross product. It is the only part that cares about the delta element being on the left or the right. Now, I stole the two limit trick from L'Hospital's rule, which was actually done by uh, one of the Bernoulli brothers. Let the problem three vector go to zero first, and then let that scalar go to zero. And that scalar commutes. All right, so here is the time-like quaternion derivative definition. The name timelike comes from considering the difference between two events. If the changes between the two events are greater in time than in the three directions of space, then the events are timelike separated. One event might cause the other. The two events can have a causal link. A different label I could have chosen was to call this the directional derivative along the real axis. And to be a true mathematical physicist, perhaps I should have called it the time-like directional derivative along the real axis, but that's a little wordy. Whatever the label, the definition stays the same. Put this to good use on the simple function f equals q squared. And this was the first time I solved a limit problem outside of MIT. Now, even if you've never solved the limit problem, a few minutes staring at these four lines might provide a flavor of calculus. The first line is the definition of f squared uh, as, the, as the function. And the second line multiplies out all these terms. The third line applies the limit of the three vector going to zero, and the fourth has the scalar going to zero. So how does the function of q squared change no matter what q is? Well, this calculation says that the instantaneous amount of change uh, that happens as uh, the change in time goes to zero is twice whatever q is. What happens if the changes in time are smaller than the changes in space? the order of the two limits is reversed. First time stops, hmm. and then changes in the three vector go to zero. Oops, <laughs> that brings up the problem of the cross product again. Uh, what can be done with it now? Well, the norm of the derivative is independent of the cross product. The size of the derivative stays the same no matter how it points in space. So I'm going to call this the space-like quaternion derivative. If changes between two events are greater in the three directions of space than the changes in time, the events are space-like separated. The two events are independent of each other. There can be no causal link between the two events. A mathematician would call this the norm of a derivative. It provides less information, only the overall size of change, not its direction. Well, some information is better than nothing. So let's apply this quaternion derivative to the function we used before, f equals q squared. The derivation changes only on the third line, who goes to zero first. And then it requires a small bit of magic to go from line 3 to 4. What I had to realize is that everything there is a norm. 
everything is a scalar. Everything commutes with each other. The norm of the differential r over the differential r is unity if the division happens on the left or on the right. Time-like and space-like quaternion derivatives of the same function give different results. It is my belief that classical physics is governed by a time-like derivative. Here events can be put into a totally ordered set according to their time. This happens, then that, then that. We can make a movie of what happens, say 10 frames. There's frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The changes have directions like velocity and acceleration. Now, every pattern has a cause. Now, it is my belief that quantum mechanics is governed by a space-like derivative. Changes in time don't happen. How odd is that? Now, we cannot make a movie. Darn it. <laughs> Instead, uh, we take those same 10 pictures and we put them all together and we shine a really strong light so that we can see the superposition of the 10 frames. That is what uh, the wave function looks like. No one gets to see the complete wave function. Instead, by taking a measurement, one plucks out one frame at a time and looks at it, and it's as clear as day, unlike that fuzzy wave function. No event causes another one. They're all independents. Uh, the best we can know is the average. A standard approach to quantum mechanics uses complex numbers. Real numbers do not suffice, since they cannot account for all the wonderful interference seen in quantum mechanics. Complex numbers are a mathematical field, meaning that they commute. There's no need for that two-limit definition. Some might consider that an advantage. Hmm. Well, I actually consider it a liability because studying change correctly in space-time justifies the deep difference seen uh, between changes in classical versus quantum mechanics. Now, the reason I don't like jump on a soapbox and start banging at some kind of crazy kettle, whoa, whoa, uh, to promote this novel explanation is that, um, you know, at the present time, I don't have any testable difference between my proposal and what other people use in day-to-day -day quantum mechanics kind of work. You know, and since I don't have a specific experiment to discuss, you know, I, I, I think I have to use the term belief. Now, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, somebody with strong opinions is going to come along and bang on their own kettle. Oh, this is the right idea. This is I'm more brilliant than anybody, uh, or, you know, whatever, you know. Um, and <laughs> quite frankly, I actually don't want to get in a fight uh, with such people uh, because it ins disturbs my inner tranquility. You know, I, unlike Groucho, uh, quantum mechanics, honestly, makes sense to me. Now, there is just an absurd amount of work to do, but the ground I'm standing on feels solid because it is, it is rooted in what could be the most fundamental definition in mathematical physics, the space-time derivative. Here's the snarky puzzle. Complex analysis is a gold mine of very rich ideas. Quaternion analysis, on the other hand, is just like a barren moonscape. The best we can do is this work by this guy in the 1930s, and he was unable to show that a function like q squared is analytic in q. Now, grab the polynomials by the horns. Show that q star squared is analytic in q star. And I'm going to give you bonus points if you prove that five different ways. Thank you.